If there's one U.S. city that's most often held up as an example of our nation's failings when it comes to city planning and sustainable transportation, it's got to be Houston, Texas. Weird zoning, inhumanly wide freeways, thousands of square miles of sprawl. Well, I went to Houston to see for myself, and what I found wasn't what I'd been led to expect. Instead, I saw a microcosm of the struggle we all have in making our cities more people-friendly. So today, a visit to Houston that might surprise you, including an audacious local effort to make the city less car-dependent, coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation, viewer-suggested topics always welcome, and this was, but I'll explain it later. And this is part of my city visit series where I visit a city, sometimes a city I've never been to, or at least not just for a very long time, and try to tell you what's different or great about it from the perspective of someone with the better part of two decades in city planning and engineering. First, a bit of a disclaimer, Houston is massive and I only had two days. I did not have time to explore the 600 plus square miles the city inhabits, much less the thousands and thousands of square miles that greater Houston takes up. Instead, I wanted to explore the kind of hidden city within a city that's defined by the inner loop, I-610. If you consider the inner loop as its own city, it has a very different population density and character than what you probably think of when you think of Houston. The inner loop at over half a million people and less than 100 square miles is a bit more comparable to cities like Baltimore, Minneapolis, or Portland when it comes to land area and population. So we're going to start south of downtown and kind of go clockwise. And that puts us in Midtown, which has some of the better streetscapes I saw in the city. This is Bagby Street, which was recently redone to incorporate bioswales and natural drainage elements, which does end up being pretty important in Houston. Not all the walking environments are the best, like I don't even know how you end up with double exposed curbs that are this tall. And I'm not going to sugarcoat this, a lot of the streets are pretty wide and busy, but and this is kind of a recurring theme in Houston. All the interesting, vibey restaurants tend to be located on just kind of noisy, unpleasant streets, and they just kind of work around it. So Houston has rail. If you didn't know, now you do. It's street running, like Portland or Sacramento, which seems kind of inadequate for a metro area of like 7 million. We're talking two car trains on the red line that goes to Midtown, and one car trains on the green and purple lines. Eh, I'll come back to this, but, and I don't know if this is a running joke, but maybe it should be. The only quality grade separated rail in Houston is probably this train in Herman Park, which I regret to tell you I did not ride. Let's talk buses because the Metro Bus Network got a major revamp in 2015, focusing frequent service on high demand routes and cutting service on low demand routes. Makes sense, but ridership versus coverage is always a values decision, and Jarrett Walker's book on this is highly recommended, and he did work on the Houston redesign. I didn't have time to ride every bus on Houston's network, but I did ride Route 82, purportedly the highest ridership route in the state of Texas. It runs every eight minutes on weekdays, and you can ride it deep into the western suburbs, but I wasn't quite that ambitious. I really just wanted to get to the Montrose neighborhood, which, when I asked my Houston viewers what I should see while I was visiting, was the most mentioned neighborhood. Nearly the entire route runs on Westheimer Road, which gets very strody as you get out into the western suburbs, but even where it passes through Montrose as a sort of neighborhood main street, it's just not a good cross section. Two lanes in each direction, and not nearly as many good pedestrian crossing locations as you really need. Montrose is packed with trendy shops and restaurants, but even the hipster coffee shops have dedicated parking lots. The walking environment isn't great, and there is some density, but it's all still fairly car-oriented, although you can definitely walk to Texas's finest grocery chain. And people do walk, it's just Houston doesn't always make it easy. Like, does the city not have any authority over where power companies locate the poles that carry transmission lines? This is all happening just off Westheimer, and I love that this one has a pedestrian sign, as if to say, yeah, we know people walk here, and eh, we did this anyway. All these neighborhoods I've shown you so far are walkable in terms of there being a grid and sidewalks, and most importantly, things you would actually want to walk to. I think it's fair to say Houston is a vastly underrated city for fine art. I didn't take any pictures inside these places because it's just kind of gauche, but the Menil collection has an amazing assortment of Magritte's, Pollock's, other early mid-20th century stuff. 
And next door is the Rothko Chapel, which is really hard to even describe. You have to go inside and see it for yourself, but if you're into Rothko, I don't think it's an overstatement to call it a religious experience. For this next part, a little full disclosure. The fine folks at Bike Houston, which does great advocacy work and which I strongly suggest you support if you care about making Houston more bike friendly, link in the description. Well, they found out I was gonna be there and they offered to lend me a bike. I guess I could have told them no thanks because biking in Houston is terrible and you're kind of wasting your time if you think it's ever going to get better, but eh, I don't actually believe any of that. So instead I took them up on it and I biked to a couple neighborhoods. And I have to say I was pleasantly surprised, mostly because when I scattered out the quote unquote bike routes on Google Street View to plan my itinerary, it did look grim. But when I got to a couple of the places that looked the most concerning, it turned out, well, the city has been at work. So this is just another case of you don't really know what's happening in a city until you go there. Now let's go to where Houston really shines when it comes to biking, the Bayou Trails. This is Buffalo Bayou, which stretches from downtown west. Miles and miles of off-street paths, a lot of it made possible because the region just got slightly clever and managed to coordinate the construction of off-street paths with the construction of flood control infrastructure. It is Houston, so as you ride Buffalo Bayou, you not only get views of the bayou, but views of another kind of infrastructure the city is maybe better known for. The other one I rode was the White Oak Bayou Trail, which connects up to, I honestly don't know if you call it the Market Trail or the MKT Trail, but it's actually really interesting and varied. You do pass under freeways, sure, but you get some raised segments on busy streets that have these really helpful etchings at the cross streets. You have sections that feel like you're riding through someone's backyard while you're slaloming through dog walkers, and you've got a section that runs right on the north side of a development that's called the Market or the Mucket or whatever. They do promise good vibes if you drive into the parking lot, but, well, good vibes apparently don't extend to feeling at ease when you have to park your car in an off-street lot. But this is a city that historically has basically designed everything as if the only way anyone was gonna get anywhere was with a car, which is not that dissimilar to a lot of American cities, but Houston might even take it to a whole other level. It was really hard to find any kind of housing that didn't have on-site parking built into it. And the result is, even though I found it not really difficult at all to get around different neighborhoods without a car, driving is just really ingrained in the culture. So my advice, Walk and ride defensively and be ready for anything. Like, if you're biking on a raised, quote-unquote, protected path, definitely be on the lookout for left hooks coming into driveways. And if you're driving, you don't get off that easy either. You gotta be ready for random traffic jams at fast food drive through access points. Let's get back to neighborhoods. This is Rice Military on the west side, north of Buffalo Bayou. And this is where we really get into the variety of Houston-style townhomes that are enabled by the city's liberal subdivision regs and weird non-zoning. So you get these structures that are extremely close together with a wild variation of architectural styles and some more dense multifamily too. Rice Military is a close-in neighborhood. It's accessible to lots of other great neighborhoods. It has its own charm, and the rent is pretty reasonable. I came up with a median of $1.60 a square foot, so $1,600 a month for 1,000 square feet in an inner neighborhood that you could probably get by without a car, depending on your life situation. It's pretty enticing. This type of housing isn't just in Rice Military, and not every single family lot has been redeveloped. And yeah, most of the townhouses do have some kind of tuck under garage, but even then, there still seems to be a disproportionate number of pickup trucks in front. Biking through the neighborhoods is fun, though. This isn't disconnected suburban street networks. Inside the 610 loop, it really is a pretty solid grid. And one thing that's great about biking is you really get to see everything as you're passing by. And I have to say, Houstonians go all out when it comes to Halloween decorations. This skeleton rock club scene is basically a masterpiece. And they even decorate little free libraries. Okay, let's go into the Heights neighborhood, north of Rice Military. It's also a grid, and there are some interesting street designs. This is Nicholson Street, which runs north-south and gets you from the Market Trail up into the heart of the Heights. It's got a two-way multi-use path along the west edge, which I don't know how necessary it is because Nicholson Street itself is pretty low traffic, but it's a fairly pleasant way to travel through a pretty attractive neighborhood. 
The Heights has its own kind of main street, West 19th, just about the closest thing I saw to a main street in the whole city. I just wish more of the space was allocated to people not driving a car. Okay, let's hit downtown real quick. My takeaway on downtown is kind of a microcosm of my takeaway on the whole city. Better than I was expecting, which I know sounds like damning with faint praise, but just keep in mind how affordable this city is, some of the street transformations you see happening, and all the cool cultural stuff, some of which I've already talked about and some of which I'll get to later. Downtown has two-way protected bike facilities running both north-south and east-west and each connects to a different part of the bayou path system. There are lots of bus-only lanes, all three light rail lines converge here, and downtown is more active than I'd been led to believe. The renovated post office at the north end is a big draw, and it does have pretty cool views up on the rooftop. Let's head to East Downtown, or Edo, which is the one part of Houston that feels like it's transforming into a more conventional type of dense urban redevelopment. A lot of it is vibey, industrial-type hangouts for pre- and post-functioning when there are games and matches going on at the nearby sports venues. Big, wide-open patios and yards. A kind of unique thing about Edo, though, in the context of Houston, is that, for the most part, these places do not have on-site parking. Okay, let's quickly hit the venues that I think generate a lot of the activity in Edo. There's the Toyota Center, where the NBA Rockets play in, which has a ginormous parking garage aptly named the Tundra. I actually had to Google whatever entertainment act it was that was drawing huge crowds to the Toyota Center that night. Wikipedia says this ensemble was <laughs> laboratory created in the cauldron of a survival reality TV show. Seems cool and normal. Shell Energy Stadium, where the MLS Dynamo play, is in Edo itself, and I was satisfied that I'd rated it properly in my MLS Stadiums video. They even incorporate the train into the stadium murals. Minute Maid, where the Houston baseball team plays, also has a train station. It's just a defunct passenger rail station that now functions as a team shop. Sports mottos and nicknames are funny. This team is ready the number two rain. We'll see how it plays out. ALCS deciding game yet to be played at time of taping. I do kind of like Space City as a moniker, but Houston has more often than not adopted Clutch City, which, I don't know, it's pretty easy to be clutch when you know exactly what pitch is coming next. Okay, in a minute, I'm going to get into the meat of all this, which is the very visible battle between Houstonians and the forces outside Houston that want to keep widening freeways and making other terrible quote-unquote improvements right in the heart of the city. But first, brief reminder to click all the usual stuff if you're enjoying this glass half-full urbanism tour of America's fourth largest city. Connect on the apps and consider supporting directly via Patreon if you're enjoying these on-the-ground city visits. Travel isn't all that cheap, not even to Houston. Okay, let's head back to East Downtown. There are more people moving downtown and close in, and a lot of new residential units coming online. There's just not as much of it in Edo as I've been hoping. I mean, it is kind of cool that they have these ballpark lofts across Interstate 69 from Minute Maid Park. Oh wait, never mind. Text.eminent eminent domains the ballpark lofts because they decided they needed to widen I-69 by like a city block or two. I mean, to be fair, on the day I filmed, the freeway was congested, so maybe eminent domaining a bunch of East Downtown and making whatever's left of it even less pleasant to be in because the freeway is even closer and noisier and more polluting than it is today. Well, maybe that's all justified in the name of congestion mitigation. Oh, hang on, it's only congested because there's a disabled vehicle blocking the right lane. So maybe the reality is we need to eminent domain East Downtown just to make sure there's room for people to drive unroadworthy vehicles and drive them poorly. And this is just a small part of a mega project that's been dubbed the North Houston Highway Improvement Project. And I know you didn't just see me air quote the word improvement, but anytime your state DOT uses that word, you can be pretty sure it means the opposite. I mean, for me, and I'm just one voice out here and I don't live in Houston, but it just seems like it might be more in the city's interest to improve the cohesion between downtown and east downtown and the neighborhoods to the north instead of making it even more hostile than it already is. Competing priorities, I guess. 
Okay, for this next part, we really have to understand Metropolitan Planning Organizations, or MPOs. Every metropolitan region, over 50,000 people in the U.S. has one, and the way they function and the amount of power they have really varies from metro area to metro area. But generally, they do project selection and make decisions on how to allocate federal transportation funding across a region. So if you're wondering why so much terrible stuff gets built right in the middle of Houston, take a look at the composition of the Board of Directors of the Houston-Galveston Area Council, or HGAC. There are a whopping 37 directors representing all kinds of jurisdictions around Greater Houston, but guess how many of those 37 represent Houston or unincorporated Harris County, which together do comprise over half of the metro area population? It's just four. Four out of 37. Over 50% of the population, but about 10% of the representation. And this is a theme all over the U.S. Cities contribute more and receive less. That's evergreen. But HGAC takes this insanity to a whole new level. I mean, Houston, population over 2 million, is getting big dogged by suburbs that are like less than 1% its size. And this isn't even just about freeways or other bad transportation ideas. For example, in 2022, the Board of Directors voted to give Houston just 2% of $488 million that was granted to the region for flood mitigation following Hurricane Harvey, despite the city having taken most of the damage. I mean, that's not only insane, it's completely immoral. Enter Proposition B, which is on the ballot on Tuesday, November 5th. Prop B, aka Fair for Houston, which I think is genius branding, would amend the City of Houston Charter to require that any MPO the city is going to be part of has to have a population proportional voting system. The whole approach is really fascinating, and I really do think we should all get educated on it. I honestly didn't know anything about Prop B until I started hearing about it from multiple viewers, and the idea was so compelling I just had to get to Houston before election day so I could make a video. So if you're eligible to vote in the city of Houston, well, I don't want to tell you how you should vote, but if Prop B passes, it's <laughs> going to be extremely entertaining and instructive for the rest of us. I do want to reiterate that I did focus on the interloop neighborhoods for this video, but that is only 25% or so of Houston's population. And there are lots of interesting, diverse, and even dense neighborhoods outside the loop that I didn't cover. Neighborhoods like Gulfton that have pretty hostile pedestrian environments, and ethnic enclaves like the Mahatma Gandhi district in Chinatown, but there are really too many to mention. Because, and this may be news to some of you, but depending on how you define diversity, Houston is the most diverse city in the U.S., probably one of the most diverse in the world, honestly. Now, I'm not a huge fan of broad racial categories, but if you categorize Houstonians as black, white, Asian, and Latin American, it comes out very close to like 25% each across the board. Now, there are different mixes in different neighborhoods, but if you went back and reviewed this whole video, which I don't encourage, you would probably see about 25, 25, 25, 25. Or honestly, if you just stood in line for barbecue. Speaking of which, I'm not going to make a long-winded argument for the benefits of diversity, but I will say, Houston is world-class when it comes to amazingly delicious fusion cuisines. It is, pound for pound, definitely a strong candidate for best food city in the U.S. I'm not saying it has as many, like, Michelin star places as New York, but I had incredible food in very unassuming-looking places for extremely reasonable prices. So I'm not saying Houston has solved racism, but my observation as a mildly oblivious white dude is half the battle is just getting different people to be around each other, doing normal everyday things in a normal way. And this seems to happen in Houston proper, more naturally than it does in just about any other U.S. city. So if you're someone who really believes there just has to be Dutch bike infrastructure everywhere before you'll get on a bike, you're gonna be unhappy here and you should probably just move somewhere else. But if you're like me and bike infrastructure is important, but just one of many, many things you weigh when you're considering a place, and you also care about a growing culture of livable streets activism or like rodeos or, I don't know, housing you can actually afford close into a city that has world-class art and amazing diversity and culture and cuisine, well, Houston is going to check a lot of boxes that most cities can't even come close to checking. 
Remember, if Houston, home of some of the most wretched freeways on the continent, can get organized around people-friendly land use and transportation priorities, any city can do it. And don't let anyone tell you biking in Houston sucks because it's actually very fun. Eh, especially if the ED of Bike Houston delivers a cool bike to your hotel. Yeah, this is as good a time as any to acknowledge that I am visiting a lot of North American cities and staying in a lot of hotels and hooking up to a lot of dodgy seeming Wi-Fi networks. But that's where today's sponsor, NordVPN, comes in. I mean, I'm making a video every week, and I really do have to work every day to be able to do that, so just disconnecting for a few days while I'm traveling isn't really a choice. But I don't love sending information over public Wi-Fi, and I don't like having my IP address out there. It may not seem like a big deal, but there are any number of things that bad intention people can do if they get a hold of your IP address. Like, they can do a distributed denial of service or DDoS attack, just for funsies, I guess, or as part of some sort of ransomware or other nefarious purpose. Well, if you're logged into NordVPN, which is just one click, that person isn't gonna see your actual IP address, they're gonna see something in like Phoenix or whatever. And this is just one thing that makes NordVPN kind of indispensable for me these days. It does also have next-gen encryption, it blocks malware and trackers, it gives me peace of mind when I'm traveling, which is usually when I'm the most harried. So this is why I recommend NordVPN so strongly. I just have other things to worry about when I'm staying in a hotel in a strange city and I don't need my internet connection to be one of those things. Anyway, if you sign up for any of NordVPN's two-year plans during their Black Friday promotion, which is active right now, you're gonna get four bonus months on top if you use my code. Also, if you're booking a winter vacation outside the US, maybe to somewhere tropical, maybe south of the border, it's been known to happen, there's a little hack you should know about. Like, if you're booking hotels or car rentals, there are a lot of websites that will quote you a higher price if you're originating from a US IP address. But NordVPN lets you choose an IP address from a wide variety of countries, just saying. Anyway, NordVPN does come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so it's really hard to go wrong here. Again, make sure you use my custom code down in the description. It does get you four months for free, and it does help support the channel. And thanks again. And that's all I've got. Thanks for joining today, and thanks as always to the patrons. I did pay my own way on this trip, just because that was really important. So the direct support really does help. Thanks again to Bike Houston and the folks behind Prop B for being super generous with background information and a bike. It's not always that easy showing up in a city you don't know all that well and trying to get up to speed on issues and neighborhoods. I did really enjoy being in Houston though, and I will say that Texas barbecue slash Thai fusion is kind of life-changing. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new installment next week, and I'll see you then.